You are tuned into Earth Tones with Allison Keslow. Joining me on the show this week is the super talented and very chill jazz trumpet player, composer, and recording artist, Phil Grenadier. I've had the pleasure of hearing Phil live many times, particularly with his longtime bandmates, saxophonist Jerry Bagonzi and bassist Bruce Gertz. Phil's trumpet playing transports you in a magical way, opening up your senses and emotions. Phil was raised in a musical home, and his dad introduced him and his two brothers to the trumpet at a young age. Phil has loved music ever since. At 16, growing up in San Francisco, he was already working with, as a sideman, such legends as Ella Fitzgerald, Mel Torme, Tony Bennett, Carlos Santana, James Brown, Sammy Davis Jr., and many more. He's recorded two albums for Blue Note, and he has three albums out as a leader, and is featured on many, many albums as a sideman. In fact, I am lucky enough to have Phil play on two of my songs from my album Bass Dharma. In our conversation, we talked about his musical beginnings, musicians he's met along the way, his 2007 tour with John Schofield, his upcoming pandemic album release, and much more. Phil says, you never know who's listening and who you might meet on the gig, so stay open to who shows up on your path. Phil is endlessly dedicated and passionate in music and one of the nicest people you'll meet. Here's my conversation with Phil. Good evening, Allison. Nice to see you. <laughs> Phil, it's great to have you here. It's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Allison. Great to see you. I've been a fan of your music for a long time. Since I was going to Acton Jazz Cafe, gosh, when did you when did you and Jerry start playing at uh, Acton Jazz Cafe? I would think in the mid 90s. I'm, I'm feeling, you know, yeah. but maybe a little later. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Around the time I was at Berkeley, I was studying with Bruce Gertz, and um, your music has always transported me through your improvisations and just so creative. Um, I love your work. Well, I, thought you. I'd, I thought I'd start today. Um, I'd love to hear about your beginnings playing trumpet. You grew up in a musical home, and you're from San Francisco? Correct. So your your father not only started you on trumpet, but your two brothers as well. That's right. My father uh, was a huge music lover, loved jazz, and he played trumpet. And uh, he was uh, his uh, peak period was in World War II. Uh, he was in the army band, and so uh, you know, so that's his era of the big band era. People like Harry James and Benny Goodman, and so yeah. uh, when we became <clears throat> of age, he was super supportive of us and. Uh, Got us all yeah. into playing trumpet, and uh, I, my earliest memories of him playing music for me. It's incredible. That's so cool. Yeah, that's good training and uh, and big band stuff. Uh, I, a lot of my early training, you know, was on it was in big band, and growing up in a music home is so special. So um, it's interesting that not only yourself and your brothers, but your so your dad started you all on trumpet. That's an interesting way to get started in music. A lot of the time, people start on piano, but you That's took true. to it. You took to it more than your brothers. Well, we all we all I mean we all took to music for sure. And uh, my brother Larry, <laughs> who's a famous bass player now. Um, he stuck with the trumpet for a few years. He probably played it through sixth grade or something like that. And my brother, Steve, who uh, quickly moved on to guitar. And uh, nice. So we all we all played together. You know, we grew up playing, you know, we had a house trio, consequently. That's but, great. Uh, yeah, I was the only one. Uh, I don't think it was the wise choice to stay with the trumpet, but uh, that's what <laughs> I did. That was, you know, and so, yeah. Um, my dad was so supportive and got us, you know, whatever we needed, uh, great lessons with local teachers and, uh, you know, just driving us to lessons and getting, getting me good trumpets, and my brother's amplifiers and instruments, super supportive, you know, really, I feel totally blessed by that. 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. I can so relate to that. My mom being a jazz uh, pianist. Oh, wow. And growing up with her uh, playing all the time and gigging and passing on her love of music to me. And not only not only did you have a musical home and your brothers were also interested in music, just like you and your dad gives you the special gift, but you were in an area where a lot of amazing things were happening musically. Is that right? San Francisco was, was uh, I mean, it probably still is to some extent, but uh, when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, it was a real hotbed for uh, great music. You know, uh, California, San Francisco has always been kind of an open-minded kind of uh, situation beyond music. And uh, the, the music was very, uh, everything came together. So, there were, you know, we were blessed to have a local radio station that played jazz 24-7. Those are pretty few and far between. So K-Jazz Radio uh, turned me on to a lot of things. And showing my age, I would sit there with my uh, cassette recorder on my stereo and record things, you know. And mm. that was, was pretty amazing to, to have that. But, uh, you know, there's so many great musicians there. A lot of, you know, Tower of Power was there then. You know, they were pretty yeah. fresh at that time. I, I wasn't there for the beginning, but uh, I remember yeah. seeing them probably in 1979. I was 16 years old, you know, and wow. things like that. And, uh, you know, but there was always Latin music. There was funk music. There was j uh, great jazz, the Keystone Corner was an amazing mm. jazz club with some of my earliest memories of seeing music there. And so that really left a lasting impact in the Great American Music Hall. Mm. Um, where you just can see uh, national musicians coming, but also a lot of, lot of uh, famous people because the Barry was such a paradise uh, to live at that time. There probably still is on some level, though it's quite expensive now to live there. But you had a lot of people there that were legends of the music that oh, were living there. People like Tony Williams and wow. Joe Henderson and Bobby Hutchison and a, a lot of, I could go down a long list of people that were there, you know, George Cables and Eddie Moore and all kinds of great people uh, living there. So we could, you know, we had access to them and see them locally. And so when, when was this taking place? Like... What de what decade are we in? Well, basically, I you know I would say in the eighties. Eighties. You no, know? yeah. So the Keystone Corner was probably open from the early seventies till nineteen eighty three. I want to say, and so that was a great club. But things continued. It was always you know, kind of recycling itself. So other clubs came along the way. But there were, and and for me as a trumpeter, there were always like uh, master trumpeters there. So. When I was coming, I mean, I had great trumpet teachers and I could talk about him, but, uh, you know, the legends were like Eddie Henderson was there, uh, one of the great trumpet players still with us in New York, and he was there living there. And then he left, and then a, a, a legendary trumpet player who, uh, named Johnny Coles, who played with Herbie Hancock for years, so he lived there, so I had great contact with him. And he left, and then Don Cherry moved there, so there was always somebody to really look up to kind of incredible. Not only were you taking in all this amazing music, and did you say that you were actually recording some of it in your early years on a, on a tape recorder? Did I hear you say that? Well, I didn't, but I probably did. Probably like a, a Sony <laughs> Pro Walkman. I have so, certain things, maybe not the earliest, but okay. the, uh, yeah, mid eighties, definitely. I recorded a lot of things, yeah. And so you loved the trumpet and you started working like really young, very young. You were in demand at like such a, like at, at 16. That, that's true. I, I was blessed to have a, an amazing trumpet teacher who uh, was so encouraging and uh, just a beautiful man on every level. And uh, his name was John Coppola. Mm. And uh, he, he played trumpet uh, his peak period, I don't know if his peak period, but he, he played with the Woody Herman band. He played with the Stan Kenton band in the 50s. So he wow. had, you know, serious cred. And he was a, a San Francisco native. Uh, well, he, he, he was there for years. So when I started studying with him at 16 years old in high school, um, he took a liking to me and saw my potential and started 
using me in his bands. He was working a lot. He was very in demand in San Francisco. So he started me out in like a lot of great things. You know, you do something and you meet 10 other people consequently, and then just kind of escalates from there. So he, he started me very early as a professional and joining the union and all those things. Mm. And back then the, the work was, was pretty uh, incredible in San Francisco. So I was able to work uh, a lot. People in the band were, were quite established, you know, so yeah. I play, you know, people in those bands, we were just playing shows, you know, kind of not cheesy shows, but, you know, background music for people. And, yeah, you know, people like uh, I mean, some of the famous people, Herb Stewart, who was one of the four brothers with Woody Herman, he was playing with us. Frank Tusa, who played bass with Dave Liebman, Lookout Farm. Uh, Vince Ladiano was a, a fantastic drummer still in San Francisco. He played with Woody Herman and uh, Cal Jader, and Mark Levine was a, a fantastic uh, trombonist and piano player who worked with Woody Shaw and Blue Mitchell and Cal Jader. Um, and, you know, I probably backed up people back then, you know, it, it kind of filled out my uh, resume where I played with people like uh, Carlos Santana and wow. Tony Williams and uh, Omar Hakim mm. and uh, Ella Fitzgerald and Mel Torme and George Shearing, you know, so I'm, you know, like 18, Amazing. 19, 20 years old. And getting that experience, so that that was pretty impactful. You know, made me want more, if not if, if, at the least. Wow, that's so exciting! And <laughs> and you also played with Tony Bennett, is that right? That's true. The great true. Tony Bennett, who just did two nights in August at ninety-five years old at the uh, Radio City Music Hall with guest appearance Lady Gaga. That's pretty incredible, right? Isn't that God incredible? Isn't that and amazing? I met him a few times. I played with him that time, and then I met him. I used to work for a short time, maybe uh, less exciting, but I worked with his daughter, Antonia. Oh, wow. And we, and we, and we played at uh, the Lions. Is it called the Lions Den? At one of those casinos in, uh, in nice. Connecticut. And he came okay. and hung out with us, so that was good to see him. Oh, yeah. that's so cool. That's <laughs> awesome. He seems super cool. I love Tony Bennett. Totally. And um, so this is must be why at age 17, um, Phil, you're so modest, you were voted best jazz soloist by Downbeat Magazine and California Music Educators Association. That's pretty <laughs> amazing. And so understandably, you wanted more. And so you moved to New York in the late 80s. Is that right? I moved, yeah, moved to New York in 88. That was always my dream. I started visiting New York when I was uh, fresh out of high school in 1983. Spent three months there with a, a great friend and uh, visited in 85 and probably another time before I moved. So I was, when I was working, uh, I was saving my money because I knew I wanted to move to New York. And so when I left in 88, New York, uh, San Francisco was popping. So I was probably doing 30, literally 30 gigs a month wow. and saving my money so that when I moved <clears> to New York, I would be able to uh, just uh, not take a job at Starbucks or whatever, you know, the right. uh, equivalent would be. So that was an amazing, uh, it was a great move for me. I learned so much from that experience and, and got to play with more people. And there were a couple of people I noticed uh, on your website that were really influential to you, um, you know, in, in, during this time period. One was a saxophone player named Bob Belden. And there goes my text. And uh, yeah, Bob Belden on is it Bob? Is it Bob texting you? No. Yeah, no, it's not Bob. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, he passed a few years ago. Oh. Uh, he was a, a great, great man and uh a fantastic sax player and uh an arranger compose uh, a little composing but he just put stuff together and so he he was a huge influence on me and it's a good story with him that i tell my some of my students now is like sometimes you never know when you're going to meet somebody that's going to really affect your life 
and so I, I, I was doing a gig that was, it wasn't beneath me, but it was not the most sexy gig where it was like, I was already, you know, out of school, living in New York. I was teaching at the Manus College of Music and some student at the new school of music said, I'm doing a uh, recital. Would you, would you do that with me? And I said, okay, I'll do it. And so I did the gig and, uh, in the audience was Bob Belden, who was, uh, you know, he had recorded for Blue Notes. He had done a few records for Blue Note, the music of Sting, and he mm. had recorded for other labels before that. He was a pretty well-known guy, um, played with Woody Herman for years on saxophone. And he said, you know, I really like your playing. Can you give me your card, you know? And I gave him my card, and he was nice, you know? Didn't think of any other. And within a day or two, he called me the next day and said, well, I have this record for Blue Note. I want you to play on it. Wow. And it was, wow. you know, it's like, you know, so I tell my students, you never know, you know, if you can do the gig, you know, sometimes it's worth doing it. And so uh, that that was a, a stack record. It was it was a kind of obscure record called Turando, which was the music of Puccini arranged for jazz. And so it had people like Tony <clears throat> Williams and Paul Motion and Joe Lovano and Wallace Roney and I'm playing in at the Avatar Studio, which was one of the, probably the best studio in New York, or right up there, with all these great, great players. And so, man, that's a, a fond memory. And I did a few records with him, and uh, he he took me on some great gigs. Very so cool. I'm, and taught me a lot about Miles Davis. He was a real Miles Davis aficionado, and he did all the. Uh, all the reissues on CDs for Columbia of Miles Davis stuff. He was the producer, so he was like so knowledgeable wow. and just a great dude. I love, I, I, I miss him and love him. Yeah, thankful. Byrak, Richie Byrak. Can you tell me a little bit about um, his influence on you during that time with your other dear friend, Bob, around that same period? Yeah, that was around the same period. Well, you know, I, I, I was blessed to get this teaching gig at the Manus College of Music. And there was a woman in charge who just blessed me with this gig. And uh, consequently, she hooked up this concert through Manus where I would do this duo concert with Richie Byrack. And uh, Richie Byrack was somebody that I grew up listening to in high school where I, I uh, adored Dave Liebman, the uh, soprano sax sure. player. And I guess he played tenor before that. And so I listened to this band called Quest, and I grew up on that. They they recorded on the label Palo Alto Jazz, which was right where I grew up in California. And so I had this record very early. So I adored this guy. And, you know, at, after learning more about him, I see him on lots of ECM records with Dave Holland and Jack DeJanette and all kinds of things, Dave Liebman. And so somehow I got hooked up with him. And it was deemed that we're going to do a duo gig. And so this guy that I totally adore, we started to, uh, I'd go over to his house and, and play with him. And we, we uh, basically, with our eyes set to a, a duo concert, we started rehearsing. And so uh, he taught me so much. And getting to play with him, he's like a, I mean, there's so many uh, things I could extol his virtues. But he was <laughs> harmonically super, super mm deep. He taught me a lot of just about playing and I had never played probably had never played duo before with a piano player. Mm -hmm. and so uh, I have the recordings of that. It's pretty, pretty incredible. I, I, I don't love how I played, but there are certain moments where I, I say, okay, this was pretty amazing experience. So he's still with us and he's uh, teaching, I, I want to say in Germany. I can relate to that, like doing duo work with a, a pianist. It really opens opens you up, uh, you know, to just uh, to play off of each other. And uh, one thing I also noticed, and I'm going to get some more into your your compositions, is that you do a lot of trio work, which I think is so so cool. And uh, to start from the basis of the trio, and you know, branch off into different areas harmonically to explore melodies and improvisations. It's a very, very cool thing. When you were in Boston in the 90s, you're also doing a lot of touring. Is that right? Um, 
A little bit. Uh, probably, little bit. you know, w when I moved from New York, I hadn't toured much. I did a little bit in, in France and uh, Switzerland, but I, I didn't really start touring in earnest until the early 2000s. And I, you know, I've, I've always had these certain um, things where they kind of uh, are hot for a little while. So uh, in the early 2000s, I would go to Portugal a lot. I, I had... Uh, a great friend, Leo Genovesi, who is uh, a great pianist who plays with Esperanza Spaulding and Wayne Shorter. And so he was a student at Berkeley and I met him and he hooked me up. He's been very good to me. And uh, so I started doing tours in Lisbon and Porto and that continued. So I probably went four or five times, not always with him, but he hooked that up. And so that was the start of my traveling. Um, uh, super fun. Been, super fun. I love, I love, <laughs> oh. I haven't been back since maybe 09, but I, I think, so after that, I probably, uh, I, I forget where else I went after that, but uh, in 2007, I got the call from John Schofield. And so that was really uh, three years of traveling all over the world. And so that really wow. uh, showed me another level of, of wow. Fun. Oh, wow. That's amazing. That's that's like one step removed of Jocko. <laughs> well, I met, I met Jocko back in, uh, I had a steady gig in say like uh, 85 to 87 in San Francisco. We played this after hours club in San Francisco with the great piano player named John Davis. And uh, the gig was every Friday and Saturday, 10.30 p.m. to 3.30 a.m. Wow, and, oh my uh, God. So a lot of people were, I mean, what a gig, right? You know, it's it like when they couldn't serve booze anymore, they served clam chowder and chili, you know, <laughs> I guess in, in theory they did. I don't know what went on behind the, the scenes because I was pretty young, but you know, every, uh, a lot of great people when they were in San Francisco would come by. So Art Blakey's band came by, Chet Baker came by. And at that point in time, Jocko was, uh, he was cleaning up in San Francisco uh, with this, uh, with this uh, gentleman named Brian Melvin. And so he'd come by the gig every night. Mm -hmm. He would come by and hang out. He never played bass. He played piano. He played wow. drums. He gave me music. He was super nice. You know, wow. it was great. But I got to hang out with Jocko. Yeah. Oh, man, that's awesome. <laughs> that's super cool. I love his piano chops, you know, Liberty City and all that stuff. Right. Wow, that's such cool stuff, Phil. But oh my Sco God. Schofield was something else. Schofield was, <sighs> was, was uh, again, just a super generous, just a beautiful man. And, uh, you know, I traveled with him for three years, you know, playing all over the world. And the guy was just, you know, a role model for how to be, I mean, not even to mention, I mean, first to mention his music, every night was just top notch. No matter how much traveling you do, no matter what goes on, he was like, you know, and just a beautiful guy, just super supportive and there and, uh, you know, and the band with him would be uh, Steve Swallow. So Steve Swallow wow. was with us for that time. Really? You know? Super cool. Stewart. Swallow's just a genius too, you know. And again, another guy, super smart, super uh, kind and just so much experience. Mm. You can just listen to these guys talk about their experiences forever. So that was oh, yeah. an amazing three years to travel with them, go to South America. We went to Europe a couple of times, you know, for four or five weeks. Pretty incredible. So that's like one of the biggest blessings of my life to do that. Some of your albums here. So you've done some work with your brother. Is that right? Did he play on one of your albums? Yeah, he did. Um, he, I mean, we've done some work as Sidemen together over the years. But uh, my first two records uh, kind of came about through a, a it's a record in a record label in Barcelona, Fresh Sound, New Talent, and uh, my brother Larry Grenadier, he worked with a drummer in Brad Meldo's band named Jorge Rosse, and Jorge hooked me up with this, uh, connected me with the uh, owner of this Fresh Sound, New Talent, and so I did records. This is a long time ago now, but. In 2000 and 2003, I released my first two records, and Larry plays on both of those. Along and with Jeff Ballard on drums, is that right? 
That's right. The <laughs> second record is, is Jeff Ballard and Kurt Rosenwinkel and a great piano player named Bill Carruthers. And the first record is with Bill Stewart on drums and uh, Seamus Blake and Ethan Iverson from The Bad Plus. So I was really lucky to get these guys. I mean, they were somewhat famous back then, but not like they are now. So I was kind of, you know. Jeff Ballard played with, uh, I think, with Chick Corea, is that right? That's right, around that time. Yeah, I mean, I grew up with Jeff. We, Larry, my brother, and Jeff, we all started connecting in the, in the late 80s uh, in San Francisco. And so I've known <sighs> Jeff a long time. He, he's a homeboy. And today I was really enjoying listening to your 2014 album, Shimmer. And is Larry on that one too? He is not. I, not, I used okay. to uh, I used a Boston band. It was kind of a thing where I did this recording kind of spontaneously and we said, this sounds pretty good. So let me see if my label person, Fresh Sound New Talent, Jordi Pujol, if he'd be interested. And, uh, and he was. So I just sent it to him after we had done it. And so, um, he was very supportive, so we put it out. Yeah, and that was, you know, like you say, you mentioned the, that was a trio thing, and I'm a big fan of playing trio, especially without, uh, I mean, I love playing with Kurt Rosenwinkel and, and uh, Ethan Iverson and, and other piano players I play with, but uh, I, I also enjoy playing without the harmonic instruments and I, I like the idea of just uh, playing with bass and drums and so I, I took the opportunity to do kind of kind of typical standards some people would say overplayed standards and I tried to make them my own and so that record is is uh, a lot of that just kind of stretching the boundaries of uh, absolutely standards yeah thank you for listening absolutely I loved it um you don't know what love is uh, such a such a cool vibe I loved listening to that one and I loved uh yesterday's I heard kind of like some Johnny Winter influence in there. <laughs> <laughs> that was super cool you're too I hip Allison I know I love yep. that and also I started listening to some of your newer singles and I remember checking out some of this stuff during COVID. So chill, so cool. I love how you combine so many genres of music, which makes sense because you're so versatile. Um, you've got um, some new stuff. Can you talk about some of these new singles you've been doing? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting project. Kind of just appeared from out of nowhere. And uh, my uh, old friend from, I, uh, his name is John Shapiro, and he lives in Israel for the last 20 years. And we grew up together. I probably met him in eighth grade in wow. California. And I just always remember him as being kind of a, a hippie. And uh, he had the first day I met him, he had a Beatles shirt on. It's like, I didn't know anything nice. about the Beatles. You know, it's, it's, you know, it was after the fact that Beatles were popular. And so anyway, we've stayed connected over the years. I lived with him for a year in Berkeley, California, and he moved to Israel. And so during the pandemic, we're all just kind of sitting around looking for something to do. And so he started sending me tracks, um, you know, online. And uh, I bought a nice ribbon microphone and uh, got the, uh, the ways to plug it in. And mm. so we started just doing stuff, you know, and he'd send me a track and I would do a, a thing. And it, it kind of, you know, it was kind of fun and we were just doing it for enjoyment. And then uh, we, we, we just kept doing it, you know, for, for the joy of it. And so we've now compiled, we have, we, and we just, you know, he, you know, it's kind of new to me that the, the concept of doing singles and uh, you know, right. he's into Spotify and doing things yeah. like that and, and whatnot and Amazon. And so yeah. we, we started releasing them singles and now uh, after we've done nine, nine singles. And so we have 40 minutes of music. And so we're going to, uh, I just had it mastered by Toby mountain, who's kind of a legendary, uh, masterer. And so it's going to, I'm going to, we're putting it out on vinyl. I don't know nice. when I can say it's going to come out, but it's going to be, uh, it's a bit of a vanity project. We'll see, you know, but that's uh, awesome. Yeah, That's it's just a positive cool. act, you know, and it is, it's definitely a departure from anything I've done before because it's a little more, I don't want to say commercial, but it's, you know, 
it's got the electronic instruments yeah. and things around it and a lot of reverb and but real drums so your 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 collaborator your friend is a drummer is that right is he playing drums on it, it it's uh he uses samples oh he does okay so Very he cool. has samples of live drums but uh, he's a saxophone player composer so uh it sounds but awesome. It, it, it's kind of amazing. Yeah, it's kind of camouflaged. You, a lot of my friends I play for them, they say, oh, it's a nice live band. Who's playing bass? And I was like, mm, I'm not sure that, that person has a name. Right. <laughs> 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 That's really embracing the new, the new era. Yeah, it's, it's, it's nice for the pandemic, you know, so we'll put it out. And hopefully I know people like you have, have been very gracious and, and saying they enjoy it. So that's part of the equation. You know, I've had absolutely. A lot of that, so, yeah, I heard this song today you did called Inner Sunset, and it sounded like a mix of Chardet and jazz. I thought wow, it was really cool. cool. Yeah, I was like, Oh, this is awesome. I was like, I, I'm got to go to the beach. You know, it's getting dark early <laughs> and it's getting cold in Boston. I'm like, Oh, no. There and is then, a oh little Cali vibe going on because we both grew up in California. So some of the um, ones people tell me they listen to say, oh, Yeah, sound like I'm driving, you know, by Route One in the ocean. And so you pick it up on, and you get some of the references, you know. So, oh, yeah. It is a little old and new. There's a little bit of this and that. So I think some people will appreciate it. Not everybody, but some people. Another album that I was just thinking about that I know that you played on is uh, my my dear teacher Bruce Gertz's album Thank You Charlie, and right. I wanted to ask you um, if you ever studied with or knew Charlie Bonacus. No, I wow. never got to got the pleasure to meet him. I've heard so many stories about him, and I know so many great players that study with him. And one of my mentors, Jerry Braganzi. Um, you know, they grew up together, you know, and so they, they, Jerry speaks fondly of Charlie, but I never got to meet him. I think I met his daughter maybe briefly, but what a legend, you know, but I love Bruce. I've probably done three or four records with Bruce. That was probably the first one I did with him, but Bruce, I know he's had a big impact on, on you and he's had a huge impact on me as well. Uh, so we definitely have to talk about your long time playing with the amazing saxophonist, Jerry Bagonzi. That's right. So how did you and Jerry meet? That's a great question. So I met Jerry probably, I want to say it was thanks to a, a drummer you probably know, Brooks Offerman. Wow. And he, he hired us on, as sidemen on one of his records. I w I w if I was to guess without looking, I'd say 2003. Mm. And... Uh, so it was just after I'd done my records, my first records. Do you all um, compose together the lines that you create together or how does that work? What can you let me in on the creative process of how you compose your lines together? I can take no credit. So it's all Jerry and, and uh, Jerry, you know, and what, what you know, I, I've been so blessed. I've, we've mentioned, you know, John Schofield as a mentor, my trumpet teacher, John Coppola. But Jerry Raganzi and uh, also as well, George Garzone, another amazing yes. sax player and friend. These guys are just, you know, I just uh, ride their coattails and I'm so blessed <laughs> to be around them. So I learned so much from them. And uh, Jerry is like, man, uh, so, you know, so we're, we're approaching 20 years together, you know, and I don't remember when, like I said, we probably had acting was the first time I started to actually work in his band. Mm -hmm. And so that's, we're looking at 15 years, probably at the minimum, you know, and I've probably done six or seven records with Jerry, but, um, and even during the pandemic, you know, we've been playing, you know, 10 years at the lily pad in Cambridge. Wow. Uh, every Monday night. So that's great. Right. That's and then amazing. during the pandemic, probably a little more than a year ago, we started saying, man, what are we going to do? We couldn't play at the lily pad and we would do sessions, you know, uh, with masks and, and uh, socially distanced, but we, you know, so we said, let's, let's get into a recording studio and start to live stream. So we could, you know, kind of put our music out to the world from, from Peter Katrimas. Right. PBS studio. Is that right? Exactly. In Westwood. So we've been doing that for a year now. And, and this sounds crazy. I don't know who else can say they've done this, but we've recorded now over these weeks, once a week, every Wednesday night from eight to nine thirty, 
on Facebook, we've recorded 205 of oh Jerry's God. compositions. Oh my God. And they're <laughs> on a tape. Not that anyone would care to listen to them. But I mean, you know, Thelonious oh. Monk couldn't say that. that he's got, you know. That's unbelievable. It is. So what a learning experience that has been. Because, I, you know, I, I forced myself to go back and listen and, and suffer through. It's like looking in the mirror. And, and it's like, you know, I, and so it's been a great learning experience. <laughs> I, I love listening to those live streams on Facebook. Well, thank it's you. So, so needed, the, you know, to be entertained, to be transported, to open your, your awareness and your mind. Also, Jerry is for a long time been really interested in astrology. That's right. Oh, he's always been that way. Yes. Wow. Numbers, I, I, numerology, and astrology. Yes. And Phil, I was looking for your birthday, but what's your sign? I'm just curious. Aquarius. You're an Aquarius. Oh, okay. That makes sense. My oldest son is an Aquarius. So you're very innovative <laughs> and different ideas. Aquariuses are a little out there. They're definitely a little out That's there. That's what they say. <laughs> and Jerry, what's Jerry? Let's see. He, he is born, I want to say October. So what is he? October so 20 something? So maybe he's Scorpio or Libra. Yeah. We're in Libra right now. I'm going to have um, to look that. I know, I know Bruce is a Sagittarius. See, Jerry will look at your chart. He'll tell you everything and more than you ever wanted to know and look at your mood. <laughs> more than you and, want to know. <laughs> you know it's, it, it's really incredible. If you knew your it birthday, is deep. it's deep. It is deep. He goes way deep. And he's got all these charts on his phone and his computer. He's got all these things to uh, modernize. But yeah, uh, very cosmic. He's an he's a, uh, amazing man where he, he looks at music that way and water and fire and all kinds of uh, Man, he, the students that he has at New England Conservatory and, and before that, you know, they're very blessed to have his influence. I'm blessed to have his influence. He's an amazing man. I would love to talk to him about astrology one day. I've talked music with him before. You're also a professor at Berkeley College of Music in the Brass and Ensemble Department. And my appreciation for jazz is Deep. It is just so deep. I think it's so important um, that young people know about this art form and keep keep it alive and the spirit of jazz and connection through music and improvisation. Why is jazz music such a great pathway to deeper understanding of music? Oh, wow. Beautiful question. Well, that's probably... Uh multi-level a lot of lot a lot of good can come from that you know um th there's so much tradition and innovation in jazz you know and i feel like uh just the uh, the template of of the growth of the music can influence anybody no matter what you're into you know and then jazz has had a lot of tough times you know where a lot of the greats that we look back on with uh such love and joy they had to suffer for their music you know and that mm. that's not something that we want to uh, wish on anybody but it, it can be a little right. inspirational and keep us uh, motivated and going forward but jazz has so much stuff you know i mean to me what i love about it too it, it's a group effort it's not really one person uh just being a virtuoso it, it's a it's a team thing and so you start to you know, the, the concept that you can use in any music is listening to others and, and being in the moment. You know, I, I realize that people can write amazing compositions and you, you probably don't need, you could probably just do it at home by yourself. And that, that's a lovely, beautiful thing. But at the same time, some of the jazz stuff I, I really feel like is, is something that's so organic and, and comes from, uh, just a tradition and, and the, the idea that you're trying to be different and innovate, but still being uh, aware of the tradition, you know, that, that delicate balance, things like that. And, and just Absolutely. The, the great musicians, you know, their own personal sounds and literally the sound, you know, just purity of that, you know, in the voice and all those beautiful, inspiring things, just like you would read in an author or a filmmaker mm. or an art, you know, uh, an artist, you know, 
uh, painters or uh, things of that ilk. It's like yes. it's all universal, you know, and so you could take inspiration from all those things. And just like I could take an ins we could take an inspiration from a painter or a movie maker or things like that. It's all kind of in that same realm where you're, you know, you're aware of the past, but you're, you're moving it forward and, and your own voice is ultimately what you're going for. And I try to reiterate that my students, that same sentiment is like, you know, ultimately, yeah, we're, we're trying to learn and we can, we can love Miles Davis and John Coltrane and all these people that really inspire us. But ultimately our goal is to have our own voice and what we, what the stories that we want to tell. So I feel like jazz is a great representation of, of that uh, template or, or whatever you would say. That's a beautiful answer. That is so true. Um, seeing the humanity in jazz, knowing where where it came from, um, can deepen your your uh, your appreciation for it, and also um, it's a glimpse into the soul. Yes. Finding your voice and and being and the audience is such a huge part of it too. The audience and the people who participate in live music with us. Um, I'm sure I know you're this way too. We just love our audience so much. They're like that other element of the music and the people who understand it and get, get you know, uh, live music and jazz. Completely. That That is a, a beautiful thing. We've been reminded of that since, I, get, I don't know if we're post-pandemic, but we're, uh, you know, on, on that uh, way and uh, coming back to that, it just you're continually amazed by the uh, the power and impact just sharing and I, I look at the audience these days you know and it it kind of freaks me out a little bit where you see like you know 30 40 people in masks in the audience you yep. know at the lily yep. pad for example pretty small place and yep. they're there <laughs> yeah and they're just trying to listen and soak it yeah. up and enjoy themselves it's like oh, man yeah. i mean look at where we're at now you know oh, god bless these people such a blessing Totally. Well, it has been such a pleasure having you on Earth Tones today, Phil. Thank you so much for joining me. Allison, it's such a pleasure. And you, you didn't mention, you know, I got the great pleasure to play on your record, Bass Dharma, you know? That was such an amazing day. You had just come back from touring with Bob Moses. I think you just got off the plane. And we did it in one day, two songs. It was a fabulous time. Um, I remember we had Dennis Hughes on keys and Mike um, Connors on drums. That's right. And uh, my husband, Peter Wernick, played guitar on one of those tracks. So it was such yeah. a great day. And I'm ready for more. So it's I've a great written- great record. Let's do it. Thank you. Yes, I, <laughs> I, I've been writing, I've been writing. What a great conversation with Phil. You can find out more about Phil Grenadier by visiting his website, philgrenadierjazz.com. I will have all the information listed below on where you can hear his music and find out where he's playing next. Thank you again for tuning into Earth Tones. See you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>